with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 13 and 14. Today we're going to see that we need a trusting king, one who will trust Yahweh no matter what they face. And as I've studied, I mean, I've read Samuel before, but studying it with you all has been so helpful, and I've seen so many things I didn't know before, and this week I really thought about just how amazing a king Saul could have been. At the end of chapter 14, the author lists five different nations that Saul fought against, and it says he, wherever he turned, Saul routed the enemy. If Saul had trusted God, he would have been an amazing king. He could have conquered the whole area. But even greater than Saul is, is Jonathan. He would have been a king unlike the nations. We'll see in these chapters that he was humble and inspiring and wise and sacrificial. He was a great warrior, better even than his father. If only Saul had trusted God, then Saul would have conquered and died, and then Jonathan would have been king. And who knows what heights Jonathan could have led Israel to. Now, I want to be clear. Obviously, God's plan is better. He is wiser than us, so I'm not saying that things worked out poorly. They worked out exactly as God had planned. But I just kept thinking, if only Saul had trusted God. And then that led me to think of myself and of us. What if we would trust God? How, what could God accomplish through us if we would trust Him? What pain and suffering could we avoid if we trust Him? How could He change us if we would repent and trust Him? How could He be glorified in us if we would trust Him? As we look at 1 Samuel 13 and 14, we're going to see in a contrast between Jonathan and Saul what it looks like to trust the Lord but before we read, let's pray and ask Him to help us trust Him. Father, we, we love You. We are thankful for You. We know You are wise and good, and yet we often fail to trust You. Even as we sit here, we've, we've gotten here to church. Some of us have woken up very early or stayed up late or worked hard or gotten the kids. We've, we're here, and yet we are tempted to give in to the lie that there are better things to think about. That your word is not true. That there are so many things going on in our heart that tell us something different. God, I pray, help us trust you. Give us the gift of faith this morning. Help us believe through the words of a foolish preacher's mouth and the meditations of a sinful people's heart can be acceptable in your sight. For you are the covenant-keeping faithful God, our rock and our redeemer. Father, we pray, help us trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. To remind ourselves of the story so far, God has faithfully protected Israel for 400 years through the judges. And then Israel decided they did not like that, and they wanted a king so they could be like all the nations around them. And so God disciplines them, and he gives them Saul, the one they have asked for. He was anointed king, he delivered Israel by God's grace and power uh, from the Ammonites and from Nahash, their serpent king. And after that victory, Samuel gathered Israel. Samuel the prophet gathered the people to renew the kingdom and the covenant to make Saul king before Yahweh. That's what we studied last week. This week, if you look to verse 1 of chapter 13, it says, Saul lived for one year and then became king and when he had reigned for two years over Israel. So we're getting a timeline here. He was anointed. I think the best way to understand this verse, he was anointed king and then went a year, and then he was made king before Yahweh, which we just saw in chapter 12, and it's been two years since that. So just to catch us up on the timeline, two years have elapsed between 12 and 13. That's what I think the author's saying. With that in mind, look at verse 2. Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. So Saul, one of his first acts of king, is to establish a standing army of 3,000 men. Israel didn't really have a standing army before this time. There was a battle. He just called everybody, and whoever showed up, they went to fight. He's established a standing army. And we're going to see between him and his son that a trusting king 
forsakes fame. A trusting king forsakes fame. Saul has 3,000 men, which is not a lot. We'll see compared to the Philistines, but still, you can do a lot with 3,000 men, especially if you remember chapter 10, verse 7, where Samuel promised to Saul, do whatever your hand finds do, for God is with you. Saul has from God an unqualified promise of success. He can take those 3,000 men and march straight into Philistia and take all their cities and win the war. Instead, what's he doing? Well, he is camped at Michmash, which is in the hill country of Bethel, so miles and miles from the Philistine army. And Michmash means hidden place. So Saul, with his army, two years into his reign, is hiding in the hills instead of using the promise of God to fight against Philistia and their armies. But not Jonathan. Look at verse 3. Jonathan, it just comes out of nowhere. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines. Now, the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba. I mean, that again, there's like no context there. I love the way the author of Samuel is like, hey, and then Jonathan, Saul's hiding in a cave in the hills. Jonathan has defeated the garrison. And I would argue that this was, I think it's pretty clear this was Saul's job. He should have been doing this, especially again, back to chapter 10, Samuel told him, after that, you shall come to Gibeath Elohim and in Gibeah, Geba, Gibeath Elohim. I think it's just different names for the same place. After you shall come to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. So Samuel anoints Saul king and says, and hey, do whatever your hand finds to do. The Lord is with you. Also, there's a garrison of the Philistines right there. It's a great place to start to win the holy war that you're supposed to start and save Israel with. And for two years, Saul has done nothing. He has not started that war. Jonathan, his son, took his men, trusted God, and went and did his father's job. And the Philistines heard of it. And the news spread that Israel was rebelling against their nation's oppressors. And then we get the rest of verse 3. Notice the Philistines heard of what Jonathan had done. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines. And also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. So, pop quiz, who defeated the garrison? Jonathan, not Saul. And yet he blows the trumpet. He sends out messengers. He wants everyone to make sure that they know that he's the one that did it. He takes credit for defeating the garrison. He takes credit for provoking the Philistines to war, making them a stench where they just want to come and put you down. He calls the people not to Yahweh, not to defend Israel, not even to defeat Israel's enemies, but to himself at Gilgal. Saul refused to share the limelight with his son. And before news of his son's victory could spread, he takes all the credit. And, and what do we hear from Jonathan? Nothing. The author hasn't even told us that he's Saul's son. It's just some guy named Jonathan at this point. Because Jonathan is content to miss out on fame and glory. He just wants to serve his God and his people. He is not hungry for fame and accolade. And you say, well, what does that have to do with trusting God? Well, remember, God had promised Saul, whatever you do, the Lord is with you. So does, does Saul need to take credit for this little victory over this little garrison? No, he could have gone and conquered all of Philistia. He doesn't need the credit for this little thing. He could have done anything for the Lord. But he did not believe the Lord's promise. He chose to take credit because he needed all the fame and honor and affirmation that he could get. He loved himself. If only Saul had trusted God. And we don't have the same promise. God has not promised that whatever we do will succeed, but he has promised us, I would argue, something better. In Matthew 6, the Lord tells us, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Does this mean we can never receive praise or affirmation or even fame? No, that's not what it's saying. 
It's saying, don't make that your goal. And this is really important because sometimes we, you know, we think, okay, my left hand can't know what my right, and we try and make that really literal. The point isn't literal. The point is you're not making the, you're not blowing the horn like Saul did to tell everyone what you've done. Jesus says our focus, as always, must be on our heart. If we make it our goal to receive earthly honor, glory, and fame, we may get it, but we will get nothing else. If we make it our goal to be rewarded by our Father in heaven, we will get that and may get earthly fame as well. Like Saul, we have a glorious promise to help us fight the temptation of focusing on fame and acclaim. Our Father has promised to see and reward every act of righteousness we do for Him. He is in heaven, so He's not going to miss anything. It's not like He's going to fall asleep or we're going to do it in a corner where He doesn't see because He sees in secret, and He will one day reward us, not secretly, but publicly when we stand before Him at the judgment day. And this is practical. Mothers and fathers, keep serving those kids, no matter who thanks you, because your kids probably won't. (laughs) You keep serving them anyway. Workers, keep looking to heaven, even if your boss takes credit for all the work you did. That is unjust, and it's wicked. But the Lord saw your work, and He will reward you. Church members, keep serving in the ways that go unnoticed and unpraised because God has promised us a reward better than fame. We don't need to walk around blowing the horn, getting everyone to look at us. God has promised us better rewards than that. But we must trust His promise if we are going to put off seeking fame. If we would be men and women after God's own heart, if we would trust the Lord, we must not seek glory and fame. And we see in the next section, we must seek forgiveness. The Philistines heard what Jonathan did. Saul's messengers apparently didn't get to them in time to, for Saul to take credit. And we see in verse 5, the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. Now, how many guys does Saul have? 3,000, which I'm not great at math, but is less than the Philistines have by quite a bit. The author speaks of the Philistine army the way God spoke to Abraham. He said, I will make your descendants like the sand on the seashore. And now the Philistine army is like the sand on the shore. It's no wonder we read in verse 6 that Israel, their men, they knew they were troubled and hard-pressed, which I think is an understatement. They were afraid. And in fear, the army, you know, uh, of 3,000-ish that had gathered to Saul and Gilgal, they began to flee and hide wherever they could. Some even fled across the Jordan, in a sense, undoing the Exodus, undoing the giving of the promised land. They fled and hid among caves and in tombs. And here, if we're, if we're not careful, that just sounds super negative, like, oh man, this is bad. But the authors are reminding us of something that's happened before. They're actually setting our expectations very high, because in Judges 6, we read, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And later in that story, the army of Midian is described as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. And what happened to that army? They all died. The Lord, through Gideon, overpowered this numerous enemy and brought salvation to Israel. And so the authors, by referencing these passages, are helping us. They're like previewing us. They're like, hey, here's what you should expect great salvation is going to come. Surely Saul will be like Gideon and believe the Lord and walk, march into war. And if you're, I mean, if Saul was still really worried about promise, like numbers, the text says he had 600 men, which is double what Gideon had. So we should be expecting double the success of Gideon. But Saul doesn't trust God. Instead, he gives in to fear. Look at verse 8. Saul waited seven days, time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. When did Samuel appoint this time? We're not sure. It could be that Samuel sent messengers to tell Saul, hey, go wait for me, Gilgal. It could be that he's remembering from back in chapter 10 when Samuel anointed him. He said, hey, after you defeat this garrison, then go to Gilgal and wait seven days. So we're not sure which one, but somehow Samuel, as the prophet of Yahweh, said, go to Gilgal and wait for me seven days. Well, Saul obeys the first part. And he goes to Gilgal, he obeys the second part, he waits seven days, but he doesn't get all the way through the seventh day before his patience runs out, and his fear overcomes him, and his doubt takes over. And so we read, verse 9, so Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me, 
and the peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. This was not Saul's job. He's the king, not the priest. Only the priest can offer sacrifices to Yahweh. Over and over again, in the the rest of this book, we're going to see Saul assume that God will be pleased with outward acts of worship, regardless of where his heart is. And in God's perfect timing, look at verse 10, as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Samuel was not late. A prophet of the Lord arrives precisely when God means him to. Saul is apparently oblivious to his sin, and he goes out to meet Samuel. The Hebrew there is literally, he goes out to bless Samuel, like he's in the right, like he has this good relationship with God. And then verse 11, Samuel cuts him off and says, what have you done? And this is, again, the authors are pulling in all this scripture. That is the same question God asked Eve in the garden when she ate the fruit. He said, what have you done? It's the same question he asked Cain as Cain stood over his brother's body in the field. What have you done? It's the same question Joshua asked Achan in Joshua 7 when Achan had stolen and caused Israel to lose the first battle. And as with those other times, we are hoping for conviction and confession and repentance. We want Saul to realize his sin and to cry out and to trust God. And instead, we get verse 11. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at McMash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me, not against Israel, not against Yahweh's people, against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering what a hero, right? He forced himself. Like Eve, Cain, and Achan before him, Saul does not repent at God's question. He shifts the blame to Israel's fear, Samuel's lateness, the Philistine's strength. He self-justifies. He says, all I was doing was seeking the Lord's favor. I was doing the right thing. He even praises his, his, uh, I think he's praising his bravery. He's like, look, I didn't run away like everyone else. I forced myself to stand firm and be strong and, and brave, and I offered this sacrifice. Well, Samuel doesn't take it that way. Look at verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For, when the, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Man, Samuel gives no wiggle room. He says, you've been foolish. And this is, this is important because, like, humanly, Saul was in a bad place. Right? So, so if we, this is a weird thing to say in a sermon, but if we ignore God for a minute, humanly, Saul's in a, his army is fleeing. That's true. There's a giant army about to attack him. That's true. The prophet seems to not be there on time. That's kind of true. Humanly, to stand around waiting on God is human foolishness. But faith often looks like foolishness to the world. Rather than trusting in God, Saul trusted in himself, and because of it, his kingdom would not continue. His dynasty is the idea here, would not continue. The throne would pass to, after him to someone else, not to his son, Jonathan, but to someone else, someone, a man, someone who's a man after God's own heart. And once again, man, just over and over in this passage, we want to see Saul repent. We want to read, and Saul remembered Yahweh's steadfast love and covenant faithfulness. And Saul realized he served a God of mercy and grace who always stands ready to forgive. And Saul repented of his sin. And he gave offerings, not himself, but to Samuel to sacrifice on his behalf. If only Saul had trusted God. But instead, verse 15, it just simply says, and Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. Saul says nothing. He doesn't even fake repent. He just says nothing. He lets Samuel leave. And he takes his arm and he goes to Gilgal. Like nothing happened. Saul's kingdom will not continue for his sin. And you say, man, isn't God overreacting? It was just the one thing. Like, that seems like a lot. But I want to be clear. I I don't believe Saul lost the kingdom because of this sacrifice. I think Saul lost the kingdom because he refused to repent. 
which that's, that's always true in us. We don't, God doesn't punish the wicked because of their sin only. It is primarily because they will not repent of their sin. Right? When we do church discipline, we don't discipline for sin. We discipline for unrepentance. You will not confess and repent and believe. Saul did not lose the kingdom, I, I don't think, because of the sacrifice. It was unrepentance. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that because he repeats that pattern at the end of our text today. For now, we'll keep moving with the narrative. Saul refuses to repent. He moves his army on towards Gibeah. So we've seen a bad example and a bad example. Now we get a good example in Jonathan. Because a faithful king, a trusting king, inspires faith in others. The authors begin this section by really laying out some historical detail to show us how really, 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 really bad the situation is. The Israelite army is down to about 600 men. The Philistines, as, as many as the sand on the seashore, they're advancing on three different fronts in raiding parties, destroying, killing, stealing, just blowing up cities in Israel. Saul can't do anything because the Philistines and their oppression of Israel had taken all their blacksmiths away. And so the whole army, I mean whole, 600 people, the whole army only had two swords, which is not a lot of swords for 600 people. And where is their king, right? Man, maybe he is out there in faith leading the people. I'm going to keep hoping for the best in Saul. It's not going to work out, but I'm going to keep doing it. Where is their king? Miles from the front line, hiding in a cave. A pattern we see repeated over and over. And someone new is in this camp. Look at verse 3 of chapter 14. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. This man, Ahijah, is the grandson of Eli, the spiritually blind, and the son of Phinehas, the wicked. He is a descendant of the line of priests who were publicly condemned and rejected by Yahweh. So why is he here? Well, my, my understanding is that Saul realized Samuel's not coming back to support him anymore. And as the king of Israel, he needs a priest. And so he hires Ahijah to come in and act out the part outwardly. He's got the ephod that the high priest is supposed to wear, and he's going to do the show that the Israelite king is supposed to have. It's very outward focused. And in a sense, I think the authors are setting up that it could not be worse for Israel at this point. They're hiding in caves, they got 600 guys, they got two swords, and they got an evil, wicked priest influencing their king who's hiding in a cave. And at that moment, we're introduced to Jonathan, the son of Saul. Jonathan's name means gift of Yahweh, and he was. He's mentioned in chapter 13, but the authors withhold that he is Saul's son until this moment, and I think that's on purpose. Because in, in chapter 13, we meet this man, this mystery man, Jonathan. We're excited about him. He defeated the garrison, seems like a good military leader. But only after we hear that Saul's kingdom will not continue, that Saul's sons will not sit on the throne, do we learn that Jonathan is Saul's son. Jonathan will not sit on the throne. Jonathan has heard Samuel say he will never be king. And what does Jonathan do? Does he go and sulk in a cave like his father? No. He goes and defeats another garrison. <laughs> Because he is a faithful man who loves God and cares about his people. He doesn't care about his pride or the fact that he'll never be king. He just wants to serve God. And then we hear his first words in verse, verse 1. They're repeated in verse 6. Before we look at those, I just want to remind us what were Saul's first words. He's out with his servant in the countryside trying to find some donkeys, and he can't. And he says, look, let's just go home. Jonathan's first words, again, out with his servant, not looking for donkeys, but looking to deliver Israel from their enemies, says in verse 6, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. What an introduction. What first words. Remember the first words of a person in Hebrew narrative, that is like the summary statement of their character. Jonathan has faith because his enemies are uncircumcised. This isn't a physical issue that he's worried about. God gave Israel circumcision as a sign of his covenant. To be circumcised was to continually, every day, have a reminder that God had chosen your people. So he's saying, look, these Philistines are powerful, but they're not God's people. And he knows, he has faith that God is infinitely powerful, much more than the Philistine army. He knows God can save by many. 
because a few years ago, him and his father led 300,000 men to defeat the Ammonites. He knows God can save by many, and he references, we don't have time to show all the examples, he references scripture all the time when he speaks. He knows God can save by few, like with Gideon and 300 men. He knows God can do both. He's faithful. But Jonathan does not presume upon God. He says, it may be that God will work for us. And he's willing to step out in faith that God may do what he knows God can do. And Jonathan's faith is not a private faith. It is an inspiring faith. Look at verse 7. His servant, his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. Man, what a response to your leader. What a response. His armor bearer will follow Jonathan anywhere. He's with him heart and soul. This is not out of duty. This is not out of fear. This is out of love and shared faith. Jonathan's faith has inspired his servant. And so in faith, Jonathan leads them into battle. The Philistines see them down in the gully. Their camp is separated by two big cliffs down in a gully. Jonathan and the servant go down the gully. The, the Philistines see them. In verse 11, they say, Look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've been hiding themselves. And they say, Come up here and we'll show you a thing. Which I just love the way Samuel's written that. So Jonathan and his servant climb up the cliff and they show them a thing. They kill 20 Philistine soldiers in a very small area. And the news of this surprise attack spreads throughout the camp. Verse 15, there was panic in the camp, in the field, among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked and it became a very great panic. We don't know why the panic spread so quickly. It could be they knew that the Israelites were hiding in the caves and they thought they weren't armed. And then all of a sudden this armed, amazing warrior jumps out of a hole and kills 20 of them. Whatever the practical reason is, the Lord sent a very great panic on them and an earthquake which is pretty panicking, and it goes around all the Philistine army. Jonathan's faith is leading to panic in God's enemies, but it's inspiring God's people all over the place. Verse 16, the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah, remember, in their cave, miles from the front line, uh, look and behold, the multitude of the Philistine army is dispersing here and there. And when Saul heard the tumult in the camp increasing more and more, verse 20, Saul and all the people who were with him rallied, and they went into battle, which like sounds like a movie scene, like these 600 guys are charging out of the cave into an untold number of men, the Philistine army, with all their chariots, 10,000 times more chariots than they have, 10, so many people, and they're just charging in. And that word rallied is most commonly translated cried out in prayer. So they're not crying for Saul, they're crying out to Yahweh to give them victory over their fleeing enemies, all because of Jonathan's faith. In verse 20, every Philistine sword was against his fellow. There was great confusion. His faith is inspiring and it's causing fear. In verse 21, the Israelites, apparently some of them had abandoned Israel and were fighting for the Philistines. They switch sides and they start attacking the Philistines. Verse 22, all those guys who are hiding come out of the caves and they start attacking the Philistines. All of them inspired by Jonathan's faith. And all of this reminds us of Judges 7, where when the Gideon and his men blew the 300 trumpets. The Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And just like in Judges, though Saul failed to be faithful like Gideon, Jonathan did not. He had greater faith than Gideon. And through his faith, God worked to deliver and save Israel that day. Not by strength of arms, because again, Israel had two swords. But it didn't matter, because God used the Philistine swords to defeat their army. And so Yahweh saved Israel that day. So friends, if we will trust God, if we truly trust Him, our faith will inspire faith in others. If you want to be an evangelist, trust the Lord. And that will be a wonderful testimony. Also share the gospel, but you can't share a message you don't believe. Trust the Lord. And I want to make a special application since it's Father's Day. I want to especially talk to the fathers who are here. Many of us are familiar with Ephesians 6.4. Fathers, don't provoke your children. But there's a, there's a verse, a few verses later, Ephesians 6.10.11. Finally, 
be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Husbands and fathers, this is our first responsibility. If you want to not provoke your children to wrath, be a man of faith. Be strong, not in your own strength, in the strength of the Lord. Be strong in His strength, be strong in His might. Put on His armor, not your own. Stand against the schemes of the devil. Jonathan was a gifted warrior, but that is not why his armor bearer followed him into battle. It's not why those who followed him trusted them heart and soul. Jonathan's faith in the might and power of God made it easy for them to follow him even into the enemy garrison, even into certainly, like seemingly certain death, Jonathan was so strong in his faith and the power of God that they would have followed him anywhere. So, so, men, we need to ask, is our faith inspiring? Certainly, this is true for everyone, but men especially, is our faith inspiring to those around us? Look back at verse 7. Look at what this man says to his leader. Do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Can you imagine your wife saying that to you? Can you imagine your kids saying that to you? Do you make it easy for them to want to say that to you? Husbands, do we explain what's in our heart clearly to our wife, or do we just sit silently and hope they get it? Do we make our, our wishes, do they have a track record of blessing our family, or are they more selfish and they bless us. Do we make it easy for them to give us their heart? Can they trust us to hold it? Do we demonstrate faithful character that they would willingly give us their souls to guard? Or are we more of a leader like Saul? We'll see later in the chapter, his followers, exhausted, afraid, and abused, say to their king, do whatever seems good to you. Is that how those who follow you respond, just exhausted and hopeless? Godly husbands and fathers do not long for submission. They long to inspire faith and a desire to follow. Now, certainly all of us, again, men and women, mothers, fathers, single, married, we all need to be strong in the Lord. We all need to trust His power and might. We all need to strive to have faith that inspires others. We need to be like Jonathan and run into the camp, not knowing whether God will say, but knowing He can but it is especially incumbent upon men who have been called to lead in the church and the home to be easy to follow, to do all that we can so that our spouses and children and churches long to follow us, even into the enemy camp, not because they believe we are strong, but because they know we believe God is strong. So I pray, let us be easy to follow. It may be a blessing to those who lead that God's strength may, do, may be displayed and put fear into the hearts of our enemies in faith faith into the hearts of those we lead. Back to 1 Samuel. Just like the famous battle of Gideon, God has saved by few. This is an incredible, glorious, wonderful victory. Remember how bad it was? No swords, 600 men against 30,000 chariots, and God has won this glorious victory. But as Sam Amati said, there is no good thing that Saul cannot ruin. And so we learn from Saul's example the one who trusts God will spurn foolishness. Verse 24, they're winning this victory. And the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day, so Saul had laid an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. Why would Saul do this? Well, the text says, it seems like he was worried that because his army was hard-pressed, they might desert. But the main focus in his heart is that he wants to be avenged on his enemies. Once again, Saul's made it all about himself. He wants to avenge himself on his enemies. He doesn't care about how tired his men are. He doesn't care about God because God had said in Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine. Later, it says God avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversary. So, so Saul doesn't care about his men. He doesn't care about God. He just cares about himself. He wants more spoil. He wants to look better. And as always, Saul's pride finds him standing in opposition to God. Verse 
25. <coughs> now when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. When the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping, but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Just as God provided manna in the wilderness to his people, it tasted like honey, it was on the ground, he provided food for them, now God has done it again. But their king has forbidden them from partaking of what God has provided. Jonathan doesn't know about this oath, because he was already out fighting, doing his job. So when one of the soldiers tells Jonathan after he eats a little bit of the honey, verse 29, then Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright because I tasted a little of this honey? How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they found? For now the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. Saul troubled the land, Jonathan says. He says, I was refreshed. My eyes were bright. I was back in it, ready to fight some more because I ate a little of this honey. If Saul had trusted God and allowed his people to eat rather than fearing that their desertion or that he would not be avenged, the defeat of the Philistines would have been great. But because of Saul's foolishness, the Philistines will plague Israel the rest of his life. He and his son will die in battle with the Philistines. It could have ended that day. And Jonathan shows great restraint here. He, he doesn't make excuses for his father's foolishness. But he also, he doesn't refuse to submit to it. He doesn't say, oh, I don't care what he said, and just continue to eat the honey. He doesn't get others to go against his father who's in authority. He does everything he can to submit to his father and support his father, even at great cost to himself. But, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll see that in a minute. The authors then flash forward to that night. The people are very faint. None of them, I mean, like some of you have worked a whole day of work and maybe you had to work through lunch. That's different than starting the day thinking you're about to die, hiding in a cave. The, the, the text says they chased the Philistine army over 15 miles, which I can't even walk 15 miles, much less chase an enemy army fighting for my life all 15 miles. They're exhausted. So when it says faint, again, I think it's an intentional understatement. The second the sun goes down, they're freed from their oath, and they, it says they pounce upon the, the, the animals they had captured. They slaughter them on the ground where the blood could not drain, and they begin to eat. This violated the covenant law of God. It was sin. And once again, we're hopeful to see Saul realize his foolishness and be gracious to the people. We long to read that he realized he'd put his people in the situation. We long to see him trust God and be gracious. And instead, verse 33, he says, you have dealt treacherously. Roll a great stone to me here. He takes no responsibility for his foolish leadership or vow. He blames everyone around him of treason, not just of sin, but of treason, again, against him because his whole focus is himself. And then he makes them roll a great stone right in front of him so that everyone, again, has to wait longer to eat because they have to carry their food to him to slaughter it in front of him. But then the authors surprise us, and it, we all know how the story ends, but again, they just keep giving us little glimpses of hope. Verse 35, Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. And you're like, oh man, maybe he's going to repent. Maybe he'll seek forgiveness. Maybe he'll trust God, but no. Repeating the same sin as chapter 13, Saul refuses to trust God and seek forgiveness. He refuses. Saul makes no sacrifice of any kind. It says he built the altar, and then it says nothing else about it. Because again, he's doing the outward religious things he's supposed to do without any of the actual heart behind it. Verse 36, then Saul said, this is, it, it's, so, it's such a bad idea. Then Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until morning. Let us not leave a man of them. He says nothing of God or his glory or his people or his goodness. He just cares, not about his men, but about the plunder. And his exhausted men reply, just do whatever seems good to you. The same Hebrew phrase from Judges, do whatever is right in your own eyes. But before Saul can get his army marching back, Ahijah speaks up in verse 36, but the priest said, let us draw near to God here. Saul hadn't even thought of that. But again, outward religious duty requires him to do it, so he he does, verse 37, Saul inquired of the Lord, shall I go down to the Philistines? 
Will you give them into my hand? Or I'm sorry, into the hand of Israel. I'm, I'm putting more of him into there than it actually is. But he, the Lord, did not answer him that day. Why didn't God answer Saul? Well, we've got to quick, take a, a quick detour to understand what's happening here historically. In those days, God would give direction to his leaders through what was called the Urim and Thummim. And I probably pronounced that wrong, but I could not find anyone who agreed on how to pronounce it. So just Google it and take whatever answer you want. The details of this ritual are lost, much like I would argue the pronunciation is lost. Most scholars, though, believe that, you know, the high priest, the ephod that the, the priest would wear, so he's got this, this breastplate with 12 stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and most scholars believe there was like a pocket on the back of it. And so in that pocket, they would put uh, two stones, probably one dark and one light, and it was the same weight and the same shape and the same feel, so the priest couldn't tell which one was he was holding in the pocket. They'd put both in, and then he'd wiggle them around, and then God would, or the, the king would ask the priest a question and say, hey, should I go after the Philistines? And the priest would put his hand in his pocket, and he would pray, and he would draw out one of the stones, and the stone would reveal God's answer, either yes or no, depending on which color stone he brought out. And that would be repeated a couple times to make sure that this wasn't just chance. No, this was God showing his will, yes, I should go. So with that detail in mind, we now need to go back to verse 19. We skipped over this, but, but go back to verse 19. There, the, Jonathan has defeated the garrison, the tumult in the camp is growing, the Philistines are fearful. But Saul inquires the Lord, again does the right outward thing. Verse 19, now while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult of the camp and the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Where do you think he withdrew his hand from? From that little pocket. So in other words, Saul went to God through the priest and said, should I do this? Should I go march out? The priest has his hand in the pocket. He's about to hear from God, but Saul doesn't want to wait and just says, hey, withdraw your hand, we're going. And they march into battle. Peter Lightheart says it this way, Saul stopped Ahijah in the middle of consulting God, an unparalleled act in Scripture. It does not happen any other time. Saul silenced the Lord, and in response, the Lord became silent. God will not speak to Saul again the rest of his life. He'll even go to a necromancer to try and get some answer from God. So back to verse 37. God is not answering Saul because of Saul's rejection of God. Will Saul realize his sin? Will he realize, last time I asked God, I interrupted. I didn't want to hear from God. Will he trust God? Well, verse 38, Saul said, come here, all you leaders of the people. And now, or and know and see how this sin has arisen today. For as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. Saul makes an oath, another oath. He says, as the Lord lives, which does the Lord live? Yes. So as the Lord lives, as long as that is true, whoever has done this will surely die. But no one answered him. It says, but there was not a man among all the people who answered him. Probably because they knew it was Jonathan. And they loved Jonathan, and they knew Saul was doing whatever was right in his own eyes. So Saul divides the people. He puts him and Jonathan on one side to make a point, puts everyone else. But then Urim and Thummim show that it is him and Jonathan. And then he separates himself and Jonathan. It shows us Jonathan. It says, Jonathan is taken, shown as guilty. And, and when we met on Thursday, I was convinced that this was God revealing Jonathan was guilty of violating Saul's oath. And I argued that point, and I want to retract that. I don't think that was what was happening, because if you look back to verse 37, the author does not say, God did not answer Saul's specific question. It says, God did not answer him that day, that whole day. God did not answer him, which means when the priest withdrew the, the stone from the pocket and it showed Jonathan was guilty, that was not God answering the question. Saul is so desperate to find someone to blame, he uses the room and through him, despite the fact that God is not answering him through that. And so when Jonathan is taken, it's not because Jonathan is guilty, it's because Saul is refusing to admit that God is not talking to him. Verse 43, then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done, which is the same question that Samuel asked him in the previous chapter. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I will die. 
Jonathan makes it clear it was a little bit, it was a little bit of honey that was on the tip of my spear in my hand. I didn't just gorge myself. I didn't eat anything else. But he says, and this, I think Jonathan is saying, look, I did not do anything worthy of death. But I am here, and I will still die. Why would Jonathan die? I think it's because Jonathan cares more about God and his kingdom than he does about himself. Because what did, what did Saul keep swearing? As Yahweh lives, as Yahweh lives, as Yahweh lives. Well, does Yahweh live? Yes. And Jonathan cares more about that being true and him dying than he does about him living. Jonathan is so faithful. He trusts the Lord. And in this moment, again, Saul has an opportunity to repent. He can forsake the fame of being the one in the right. He can for- confess his oath was foolish. There's multiple ways he could have got out of this, justly. He could have gone to the law in Numbers 30. It allows you to offer a sacrifice to be forgiven of a foolish oath. Or if he really wanted to blame Jonathan, he still could have done that. He, he could have had Jonathan offer a sacrifice, like it says in Leviticus 4, for unintentional sin, because Jonathan didn't know about the oath. He still could have made Jonathan guilty, just offer a sacrifice. But both would have required Saul to humble himself, seek forgiveness, and trust God. So instead, Saul swears his third oath, God do so to me and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. You shall surely die, gift of Yahweh, my son. But by God's grace, the people see that Saul cannot be allowed to do whatever is good in his own eyes any longer. They rebel against their king. Like, we need to understand, this is the army telling their commander-in-chief, no, verse 45, shall Jonathan die, who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. And then they, like their king, they swear an oath, as the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall onto the ground, for he has worked with God this day. What a, he's worked with God. So the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. They swear their own oath. Look, As Yahweh lives, Jonathan lives. For he worked with, alongside, together with God to bring salvation to Israel. They love their prince. They hate this foolish wickedness and injustice. And and so they offer up a sacrifice in the place of Jonathan. We can argue all day about whether Jonathan deserved to die or not, but he was willing to either way. He was willing to put himself in the line of fire for God's glory. And once again, we long to see Saul repent, that he would see his, his whole army rebel against him, that he almost just killed his son, and to run to his son and say, son, I'm so sorry, I, re- I repent, forgive me, to offer sacrifices, but we see nothing. Verse 46, it's, it's almost like, I want to be clear, it's not, but it's like there's verses missing. So the people ransomed Jonathan, so they did not die. Verse 46, then Saul went up for pursuing the Philistines. And the Philistines went to their own place. Saul didn't say anything. He didn't hug his son. He didn't repent. He didn't seek forgiveness. He just leaves again, like nothing happened. Again, there aren't verses missing, but just it feels like it. Like what? There's obviously something missing, and it's repentance. And then the authors choose to now to summarize Saul's kingdom, his reign, which normally is done when the, the king dies in Hebrew narrative. They summarize it now because they're showing, look, nothing's going to change. You can stop hoping and and waiting for Saul to repent. It's not going to happen. He will win many battles. He will rout the enemy wherever he goes. He will accomplish many outward victories, but he will never repent because Saul's reign was about Saul, not God. God gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to trust him and seek forgiveness, and he refuses every single time. And so as we, as we look over the life of, of Jonathan and Saul, their introductions here, perhaps you recognize yourself in Jonathan. I hope you do. Your life is defined by humility, inspiring faith, walking in wisdom, trusting God. And I'm not being facetious. I think some of you, that does describe your life, and I'm thankful for that. None of us are perfect, certainly, but we're striving to be Jonathan's. But I fear that some of us are more like Saul. Some of us are blowing the trumpet and making sure everyone hears about the good we've done so that they don't know how sinful our private lives actually are. Some of us are making and breaking vow after vow that we will never commit that sin again. 
because we're so desperate to find victory, we made the fight about ourselves rather than about actually pursuing Christ. Some of us may have been confronted by a brother or sister with God's Word. We may have been told how our sin is against God's kingdom. We may have been shown how our carelessness is hurting the people around us and and hurting our children. But because we're desperate to be seen as Jonathans, we fail to see that we are in fact Saul's. But here's the glorious truth. Whether you're a Jonathan or a Saul, the message of the gospel and our trusting king is the same. In Mark 1, the king arrives. He says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. God rejected Saul. His kingdom would not continue forever, but God sent his chosen one, the one after his own heart. The kingdom of God is at hand because the trusting king arrived. And what is his message? It's two parts. Repent of our sin and believe in the gospel, the good news. If we would repent and turn away from our sin, we must not be like Saul. We must stop hiding under false smiles and acting like we're okay. We must stop blaming other people's actions or attitudes. We must stop focusing on outward circumstances. We must instead confess our sin, take responsibility for our sin, and repent of it and turn away from it. Why? Because if we don't, we'll be like Saul. Our trust will be in ourselves. We'll believe we are justified, that we are seeking the Lord's favor, that we are right in our own eyes. Repentance must be the first step because repentance is admitting that we are not holy and we are unworthy of God. But we must not only repent, we must also believe. We must put our trust in the King that God has chosen. We must trust that He not only had the right to offer a sacrifice, that was wrong for Saul to do, but Jesus, as both king and priest, was right to offer a sacrifice, and not just some other sacrifice. He offered Himself as the sacrifice because He is that pure and that holy and that righteous, and He died, and through His blood we can be forgiven, and through His resurrection and ascension we have hope for eternal life with God. And friends, just as our trust and faith and belief in the gospel is not a one-time act, Neither is our repentance. In 1517, Martin Luther posted his famous 95 theses on the the door of his church, the first of which read, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. The gospel of our Lord is not repent once and then do whatever you want. The gospel of our Lord is repent and repent and repent and repent and repent for the rest of this life. That is what it looks like to trust the king, because whenever we're not repenting, we are not trusting God. We're trusting ourselves. And at the end of Luther's life, after 30, almost 30 years of faithful preaching and teaching and writing commentaries and starting arguably the whole Reformation, his last words, moments before his death, written out on a piece of scrap paper were this, we are beggars. This is true. His last words, one last time, he repents, we're beggars, and he believes. This is true. His life was one of repentance. So I don't know where you are today. You may need to forsake fame, reject foolishness, seek forgiveness, but all of us, whether we're Jonathan Luther or Saul or Luther, we are infinitely far from the holiness of our trusting King, Jesus Christ. So I invite you to repent and believe this morning. And more than that, on the authority of God's Word, I command you to repent and believe this morning. Do not wait until your spouse catches you and cries out, what have you done? Do not wait until your friend is forced to confront you and say, what have you done? And God forbid, do not wait until you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and He says, what have you done? Repent today. The kingdom of God is at hand today. You can believe today if you will just trust your King Friends, how may God work through us if we will trust Him? Who will be saved? How will we see our church grow? How will we see the kingdom of God advance if we will trust our King? Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful that You have sent us the Christ. We don't trust You as we should. Even as believers, we don't trust You. We're called believers and we don't believe. And so, Father, today I I repent of my unbelief. Multiple times this week, I I doubted whether your way was better. And I pursued the things of this world. Even today, I was distracted by 
the goodness I see in myself and the, the ways that I've been brave. And God, I'm, I'm so foolish. I seek fame. God, I see all these things in my heart and I pray that as we see them in our hearts as well, we would repent. We would trust you. We would forsake the good outward appearance that we may think we have. And we would confess whatever wickedness is going on in our hearts. God, I pray that you would work in us. Help us believe and trust in Christ. He is enough. And we can have faith and hope and forgiveness in him. God, I pray, let us seek forgiveness today. In Jesus' name, amen.